Welcome to A Road Less Traveled virtual podcast. My name is Hilary Heron and I'm your host. Today, Erica is joining us on our uh, traveling down the road of women in history with some information on Elizabeth Portwright Monroe and her role in early America and how it has shaped our society today. Erica, welcome back to A Road Less Traveled podcast on our historical women series. Um, talking about the women who paved a road less traveled. Excellent. Well, Clue me in. Who are we talking about today? We're talking about Elizabeth Courtright Monroe. Uh, and as I had alluded to, Monroe should should clue a few people in. Uh, <laughs> so for those of us who need a refresher, uh, just early American history, presidents were George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and then James Monroe. So we're so, actually... I was going the Marilyn Monroe route. Um, uh, so it's talking a little before that. Different century, yeah. Gotcha. But uh, you're right. Technically, Monroe was the name used for both. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so we're talking about the first ladies today. Um, okay. And we're talking about... A, well, we're going to wind up inadvertently talking about some of the other first ladies and prominent women in DC at the time. Okay. Um, but we're talking about Elizabeth Courtright Monroe because she is one of the least written about first ladies in American history. And okay. my first question is why? Well, when she was, she was ill for a large part of her life. And okay. so she died relatively young fifties, I think like not, not young, young, but middle-aged. But like, and uh, when she reference that's super freaking young, it is. And when she was ill and she was going to die, she asked her husband, "When I die, please burn my papers, burn all my personal papers." Ugh. So there are. Oh, to be fair, I've asked you to burn my journals when I die. So. You you have, um, and and I can see why. But there are literally two letters left written in her own hand that she had mailed to somebody and that got kept. Um, okay. And what's the difference is, right? So you and I write a journal, write a blog, write a whatever, Mm -hmm. and we write them as a catharsis. Mm -hmm. She was part of a generation where the men in particular knew the role they were going to have in history and were super obsessed with it. I know we've briefly mentioned Hamilton before, Mm -hmm. but think about the way Alexander Hamilton is portrayed, right? Like you're running out of time. How will history will know my story? How will they talk about me? All of the founders were obsessed with it. Yes. And Thomas Jefferson was James Monroe's mentor. And so okay. this woman was married to a man who sort of was of the same ethos of like, what I do, what I say is going to be important. All of this stuff is groundbreaking. And yet knowing she was a political wife, she was still like, eh, I don't think so. Go ahead and burn it. And do you think that that is related to, do you think that that was related to the gender roles at the time? Where she was like, I know that this is all going to be important, but I'm still a woman and I would hate to have this, that, the other thing out there. I don't think we know her well enough to say that. Okay. What what we do know about her, and this is something I've kind of alluded to when you've asked before, like, how do we learn more about Bertha Benz? Mm-hmm. How do we learn more about women whose stories haven't been told? Mm-hmm. Um, the way we do it is we look at the women around them. Well, we look at the world around them. But I think in this case, Washington, D.C., was just becoming the Washington we know it to be. Mm -hmm. The idea of having a social life, the idea of the president having social obligations was really in its infancy from Mm -hmm. 1800-ish to like 1830. So the Jefferson administration, Madison administration, and then Monroe, where Elizabeth was the the first lady. Um, Jefferson didn't have a first lady, so he did all his hosting himself. Mm -hmm. Dolly Madison kind of took what Jefferson did and ran with it. Mm-hmm. And then Elizabeth Courtright Monroe um, kind of scaled it back and she made it a little more European. Okay. And women talked about her. They wrote letters to each other. They wrote in their diaries. They published little snippy newspaper, you know, page six kind of like the first lady today or Mrs. Monroe today, like little snippy things. Kind of catty. And kind of catty. They really were. And, um, she doesn't even have a full, her own full length biography is how little we know about her, but we know what people thought about her. Okay. So one guess as to maybe why she wanted those papers burned was other people didn't think kindly of her. 
and she didn't she she didn't want that sort of dirty laundry aired in public um it could also be that she was just very private and Mm -hmm. she wanted she didn't want to be the story she couldn't change that she was married to a president but she could change how much they got to know about her i mean yeah here we are today like let's talk about her let's Uh, talk about her and she will be hosting doing the social thing and you're saying she's making it a little more European, which is maybe a little bit of a change up from what what, there, what was going on prior. Does that mean she's like scaling down the portions of their food or is she changing what's offered? Is she changing who's invited? What What is she doing that's upsetting people? Okay. So keep in mind, they're all figuring this out as they go. Mm-hmm. This idea of the presidency itself. We're let all alone, still figuring this out as we go. Oh, we cool. are. But the White House now has a chief of protocol. It has a social secretary. None mm-hmm. of that existed. It was literally, it was Jefferson in his house. Mm-hmm. That was the White House. Jefferson in the building with like some enslaved folks and a, and a, uh, um, a secretary, Meriwether Lewis, who later went on Lewis and Clark. So that's Jefferson in 1800. By the time the Mor- Monroe's get there in 1820, it's still mainly just a big house. Like offices don't exist. The West Wing doesn't exist. The Oval Office was Meriwether Lewis's bedroom from 18 of, what, 1800 to 1803. Okay. So just so, very different than the way that the presidency is now in general. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so they're trying to figure it out. And Jefferson started, I know, we kind of have to, to get it, Elizabeth, we got to go back a little. Again, looking at the people and things around her, Jefferson had started to establish um, dining and entertaining that took what he thought was very important from European dining. So um, the types of foods, the way things were served, mm-hmm. and then added what he called a Republican nature. So things that would be more egalitarian and equitable and, and more in line with the revolutionary generation. And Dolly took that more equitable to mean a lot of access to Dolly as a as a first lady. Okay. She held these open houses and anyone could walk in and talk to her. Elizabeth Courtright Monroe got rid of some of those things that were that made her accessible to the people, right? She she created boundaries and brought back some of the um more formal settings of European dining that Dolly Madison had kind of done away with. Um, in, in trying to be a woman of the people, Dolly Madison said, you have full access to me. We're going to make everything equitable. You know, this is, this is America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when she scaled back and scaled back access to her person and to the interior of the white house, which they were already calling the people's house, um, at the time they called it the president's house, the white house as a term caught on later. Okay. For our purposes, the white house, um, Women were really, really annoyed because it's part of your status was to say, I had lunch with the first lady. I had tea with the first lady. You know, I met these other famous, fabulous women, all of the above with the first lady. And they, she really, Elizabeth really limited that access to herself and it ticked women off. Shocker. Yeah. Well, um, I didn't tick anybody off if you, you know, stop having access to the things that gave you status. Right. Exactly. And so why I like talking about Elizabeth Courtright Monroe is what we do know about her is that she was, that people were kind of catty about her. Mm -hmm. And I think the word I've heard the most is she was an enigmatic first lady. Okay. For the layman, what does enigmatic mean? Enigmatic means um, hard to pin down, mysterious. We don't have a lot of info. Like the enigmatic itself. Correct. Mysterious. Nobody knows what it means. Um, it's just, and it's just not true, but Mm -hmm. what we've done is we've taken what these other ladies publicly or privately publicly said. Mm -hmm. So another fun fact, um, if I wrote a letter to you, we're in Mm -hmm. the early 1800s, I know that there's a good chance you're going to give that letter to a friend or read that letter to your family. Oh, I got news from cousin Erica and fill in the blank. She -hmm. has news about this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Letters weren't private the way we really think of privacy. Mm-hmm. And and there were obviously times where they were, and they often there were phrases you can say that like, I'll, I'll tell you in the strictest confidence, which really means this letter isn't for public consumption, mm-hmm. but a lot of them were. So these kind of 
private public letters that denigrated or talked down on Elizabeth Court Wright Monroe were what became her reputation. Kind of like um, Twitter for the time. I Twitter does very sorry about that. Uh, same concept, right? Yeah. Somebody is going to say something and it's going to get shared. Okay. Um, just not as quickly. Okay. Um, but what's really cool is she had some really interesting firsts. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the first presidential China card. Oh, I love presidential. Yeah. Um, so, as I understand it, it is all located in uh, Virginia, not in D.C., because the, the China room in the White House has a selection from, you know, the, the mm -hmm. stretch of it. But um, as I understand it, most of it is uh, at his home in or James Madison's, sorry, James Hold Monroe's on. home in Virginia. All uh, we have was has a selection China room, the White House. Ah. china room in the white house has a selection mm -hmm. of china dating back quite a ways um for the president but as i understand it most or all of the monroe's presidential china is at his home it's called highland mm -hmm. it's in virginia and it's only two miles from thomas jefferson's home monticello like this is how much monroe appreciated his tutelage and mentorship with Jefferson is that he did buy property very close to him. Oh, wow. Um, and there's now a museum there and it's run by the College of William and Mary, which is kind of one of those seminal institutions if you want to study the early Republic. Like they're, they've got the most scholars and sort of the best gri grip on it. Okay. Um, so she did things that were really important. Um, and I think even toning down Dolly Madison and setting some, some standards because public and private life are different. Um, mm -hmm. We all know that. We also accept if you've decided to be in the public eye, there's going to be less privacy. Right. But she was really trying to create where's the boundary of that mm -hmm. for presidents and for first ladies. Boundaries are um, uncomfortable for people. People don't like boundaries. They are and they don't. And so it was a real shift. The other thing is she was often ill. And mm -hmm. so she didn't have the stamina to do the kind of two or three times a week entertaining that Dolly Madison was doing. That actually was and a so she made a moment for me when you said she was ill. Like, oh yeah, well, duh, that would make sense why she didn't want to do these other things and doesn't have the energy, doesn't have the patience, doesn't... Exactly. Have... Yeah. But that said, if we go back, she... We know more about her before, like... In my opinion, I think the, the information about her in Europe is actually a little bit more thorough than the information we have in D.C. Okay. Um, she was in Europe twice. Mm -hmm. um, James Monroe was appointed ambassador to France in, I think it was 1794, so under George Washington. Okay. And then Thomas Jefferson, when he took office, appointed him again as ambassador to France. And he was one of the folks who helped broker the Louisiana Purchase. So they lived in they lived in France. Okay. Each six years the first time and I think four the second. Something okay. like that. Um and the first time they went in the seventeen nineties, they put their daughter in school and their daughter became friends with a little girl named Hortense. Mm -hmm. And Hortense's mommy, Josephine, married Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, this all now okay, I'm here. It gets better. As I understand it, I would, if you can fact check me somebody, but I, this is one of the things I've researched quite a bit. The Monroe family were the only Americans at Napoleon's coronation when he crowned himself emperor. Interesting. So I say this because I, I have to say that in the timeline of history, in my mind, these two things aren't coexisting, right? Like Napoleon seems like such a far off concept to... When the United States was, you know, founded and, and functioning in yep. its early years. Like, they, they seem yep. so. And like, they overlapped. And you forget the French Revolution. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson is the only American who was in America during the American Revolution and in France during the Reign of Terror. Well, there might have been others, but he's the most famous. Yeah. So he lived through both of the revolutions, which is crazy. Like, was in them. Um, But. The point with Elizabeth Courtright is, or Monroe, Elizabeth Courtright Monroe, Courtright's her maiden name, um, is that she was very well received in Europe. Okay. And 
Well, she yes, because boundaries and leave me alone and let's be quiet. <laughs> yes, but also the slightly more formal um, mm -hmm. proceedings, right? And they called her La Belle Americaine, which Ooh. is just the beautiful American. And she was charming. And this is where, as a wife and hostess, she mm -hmm. really learned to to hold court, right? To, to host events to uh be sort of the manager of her own space so this and i mean like that where she thrived and that yeah translated to her white white house in our terms right okay, okay exactly um and so she took what she had known and what she really perfected and brought it to the white house particularly as she was ill um fairly regularly by the time she was in the white house it was again she was later in her marriage what was she ill with we don't know um everyone just says ill interestingly um on one of my research trips last year um i got to go to highland when rose mm -hmm. home and got to speak with some of these folks who were to marry and then i went to the university of virginia in the same town and did some archival research mm -hmm. and i found a couple of letters where james monroe and james madison so the okay. president and the former president mm -hmm. were writing each other and james madison says oh i'm so sorry i missed mrs monroe she must have she was ill again and couldn't see us and so it was kind of fun as a like independent student researcher yeah. reaching back out and saying hey i found this letter i don't know if you guys know it exists i'm going to shoot you over you know the picture of pdf that i took of it huh. um because all of those little moments that tells us we knew that date that month that whatever it's mm -hmm. one of the times she was sick and therefore not in washington yeah so these letters have these little tidbits as i kind of mentioned with bertha and other other talks we had about archives it doesn't it says as much about her as it doesn't say about her right and we can almost piece work it back together like a quilt Mm -hmm. using all of these other sources about her it's very interesting um i especially like the cadence in which she was ill or you, those things can give us yeah. a better idea of you know what she might have been suffering with or um anyway that's a tear exactly <laughs> but that's okay and that's but those are the kinds of questions we ask will we ever be able to answer that probably not it could have been something like lupus uh, mm -hmm. something that was a chronic illness it could have been that she got cancer and it just was a long slow and we didn't you know it, there's no way to know but there are questions that should still be asked right there's still validity in asking the question because it means we're gonna look for an answer mm -hmm. which means we're gonna learn something even if we don't learn what we hope to learn completely yeah so yeah so she is i just think she's a really interesting figure because she made James Monroe, who was our fifth president, if I can count correctly, um, a political success mm -hmm. from behind the scenes while she was facing sort of the displeasure of the women of Washington society. Um, even when she wasn't in town, she was a she was very much a uh, emotional and moral support for James via letters and such. So did, were there women that did like her? Were there, is, you know, is there a documentation of like her friends or you know, people that stayed close and I guess that she felt safe with to use kind of more of a modern spin on it? Yeah. Um, there were letters from different women in Washington society who speak fondly of her. And by fondly, I mean more like, you know, Mrs. Monroe stopped by today. She was dressed beautifully. Okay. And that's all it will say versus mm -hmm. Mrs. Monroe has done away with the Wednesday night levies. And we're also upset, right? Like, so you'll see these little snippets of things that are complimentary. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a recurring theme is that she really was quite lovely, mm -hmm. which is great. But again, lovely, we talk about define lovely. She was lovely in the physically, physically attractive. Yeah. Physically beautiful sense. La Belle Americaine. Yeah. So when we do hear about her descriptions from other women, even they are talking about her beauty, which mm -hmm. again, going back to let's talk about how we discuss women today, we still are more likely to have a conversation about their attractiveness or lack of attractiveness before we have a conversation about their skills, qualifications, and talents. That's true. Um, and it's really super duper sad. 
it is super duper sad and it's super duper frustrating because these are women who are making specific contributions mm -hmm. that even their the other women who again everyone kind of knows that they're starting something new with this washington dc society mm -hmm. they know they're starting something new and they're still kind of throwing shade um well they're trying to be relevant right yeah like staying in the spotlight or or making some sort of statement staying relevant staying in the news i mean we see it today yeah. too. it's true and i had never thought of it like that um i'd always thought of it as dolly madison set a really high bar with being very oh, like she was a, just emotionally an open person mm -hmm. and her open houses were open where i keep using the word open yeah. right when she'd have these dinners or parties they were accessible to the public the public mm -hmm. could walk in um so it was a level of accessibility that mm -hmm. even today we're like oh that's maybe too much mm -hmm. and it it became a really hard act to follow but it in some ways turned out to be good because her successor was Louisa Catherine Adams. Mm -hmm. Louisa Catherine Adams was the, uh, was married to jo John Quincy Adams, who was son of John Adams, the second president. Mm -hmm. And Louisa Catherine Adams had also traveled extensively in Europe, which Dolly hadn't had quite as much traveling in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so she saw what happened to Elizabeth Courtright Monroe and went, ooh, I bet I could change some things up mm -hmm. and find a happy medium between Dolly Madison's like free for all and the sort of strict boundaries that Elizabeth Courtright Monroe set up. Between totally and, and totally closed. Right. And I have actually, so Kath, Louisa Catherine Adams did write everything down and we do have extensive information from her and over my shoulder, mm -hmm. one of my shoulders, oh, right there. Those two, uh -huh. those are her complete diary. Published. Okay. So I have read her words. Oh my and God, she please is, don't do that to me if I kick the bucket before you. I will not. I will not publish them, bind them, and have uh, Yale University put them in print. Um, but she is one of the people who speaks most kindly about Elizabeth. And it's because she already knows her husband's going to run for president. She mm -hmm. expects to be first lady. And we're talking one or two years into Elizabeth's shot at first lady so she is and she's writing about it she's like i expect to avoid this i expect to do this i understand that you know this is such a struggle for mrs monroe and i i bet i can avoid it and i'm like what the like she so, was she was as politically minded as her husband so she said those those are the published journals i'm interested in the unpublished journals you know the one where you write your feelings um not the right. one where you curate your your future essentially yeah well, and, and the interesting thing is when we talk about these curated manuscripts, it's a combination of the person who wrote them curating them, mm -hmm. their their family and friends curating them, and then publishers. Yeah. So there's like three levels that have sort of filtered things out. Mm -hmm. And with Jefferson in particular, in his later years, he had like a cult following in popular culture and was able to really get this amazing good press mm -hmm. and people writing newspaper articles about him later in life and people writing biographies about him in his own life that he got a say in. So a lot of, again, when we talk about these mythologized figures in American history, yeah. they helped curate their own mythology. They're right. They get to write their own story essentially. Yeah. For a lot of them. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn here and say, do it. Why? Why are we Dolly Madison, you know, first, last, and then Elizabeth Courtright Mon Monroe? So why is her maiden name relevant and Dolly Madison's is not? Dolly Madison, Madison is her, is her married name. Right. Uh, That's my Dolly question. Dolly. What is, why is, what's her maiden name? So Dolly Madison's maiden name was, well, it was Dolly, Dolly Payne Todd. So she was Dolly Payne. Then she married a man named Todd. And then she married Madison. So I Dolly, see why hers are now not. I see why her maiden. She was married several times. She was in America. She did not travel to Europe because she had this first husband. Yeah. So the little traveling Madison did was before she he married Mrs. Madison. Um, but the other thing is Courtright. So mm -hmm. I keep saying Elizabeth Courtright or Elizabeth yeah. Courtright Monroe. 
was a very prominent New York family. So she was also a Yankee who married a Virginian. Mm -hmm. And this was during what we call the Virginia dynasty. And the Virginia dynasty is Jeff. Well, it's Washington minus John Adams, but Washington to Monroe, four of the first five presidents were Virginians. Okay. And that meant that a lot of their policies were pro Virginia and pro agriculture and pro the important things in the state of Virginia Yeah. rather than, I mean, and they were worried about the whole country. Right. But it was called the Virginia dynasty. And so I think that's another reason that Elizabeth Courtright struggled is not only was her, her, her ideas, or not only were they very European, she was from New York. And while there were plenty of people from the, the Northern States, she married a Virginian. Mm-hmm. She should get on board. Dolly yeah. Payne got on board. Dolly Payne Madison got on board. That makes sense. I was just curious why her maiden name is thrown in there so much like what was its relevance i think that was why i think the other thing is um she had a daughter named elizabeth monroe they called her eliza and she did wind up marrying someone i think in new york um when she was older but i think one of them is to distinguish the mother from the daughter okay um and the other one is you, you see it more with um you know with prominent families their name is they continue to to use the name and speak the name whereas dolly madison her identity very much became the wife of james madison i find it interesting that i i don't hear often about women you know having kind of a junior which that's not quite a yeah it's not exact but i actually love that um that they named the daughter after the wife was they did and it was was the daughter involved much like was she um by the time they got to the white house the daughter was married and had had moved on but was her mother when she was ill would regularly go and stay with her okay um so we know that she was um i believe she did go to the white house once or twice um to to you know be with her father when he entertained um where we really see that though is with jefferson Mm -hmm. he was a widower and his daughter martha um would come from Monticello. It was about a, I think it was an eight hour carriage ride Mm -hmm. and she would stay for a couple of months and act as his hostess. Mm -hmm. So when he was having these more social gatherings rather than political kind of gatherings, she would act as his hostess. Well, after eight hours of a carriage, I'm staying for a couple of months and being a hostess, but I'm not. Correct. Correct. Um, and, and so we do see the presidential children do play a role in The early years, Um, James Madison never had children. Mm -hmm. Dolly Madison, when she was married before, had a son. Mm -hmm. And he actually, after James Madison died, Dolly Madison moved back to Washington, D.C. And she lived out her last years in a a townhouse in D.C. Interesting. And her son was like the bane of of her existence. He only showed up to ask for money. And he had a bad reputation in town as being sort of a you know, a loser who couldn't really ever get a job. And his big claim to fame was, oh, my, you know, my stepdad was the president. So uh, she had like sympathizers then too. It was just maybe why people yeah. liked her more. And that, that definitely could have been part of it. Um, and, you know, it, it only takes one moment of bad press mm-hmm. to kind of have that replicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but the European nature of Elizabeth Monroe's hostessing, hosting, hostessing was something Jefferson faced backlash for. And he just didn't care. And he was a man. And so he could say, but this is how I'm going to do it. Sorry, you don't like this part. Because he did use a little bit. Like, he only served French wine. And he was famous for serving French champagne in a time when he had to bottle and import it himself <laughs> from France. Um, when, when the tax collector came around to tax him Mm -hmm. on his wine collection, they had to consult him. Nobody in America was, was skilled enough to actually evaluate the price of the wine that he had in his cellars. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but that's really like thing tidbit. Yeah. So what was different about, so I, I asked this before and I'm just trying to kind of put a pin in it. Her hosting style was different. 
with the access to her and that kind of stuff, what yeah. other types of like European influences would have been harshly judged? Clothing um, was one of them. Uh, again, Jefferson was very relaxed and laid back. He would wear um, linen or cotton kind of coats rather mm-hmm. than a silk night, like night coat. Mm-hmm. We saw, um, it's called broadcloth. Um, okay. We saw Dolly do a combination Mm -hmm. Uh, she obviously had silk gowns, but she, for a lot of her sort of weekly things, she Mm -hmm. would be a little dressed down. Okay. Um, and again, the men were not wearing silk or satin coats, which was Mm -hmm. European. Um, whenever Elizabeth hosted or went out, she tended to be in very formal attire. Um, and if you think of clothing like armor, right? Like mm-hmm. when you wear a suit versus when you wear your sweats, yeah, it sends a different message. And I think it added to the fact that she wasn't, you know, that she was maybe a little standoffish and cold and not accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, and we even see one of her portraits um, where she has, it's called ermine, that white fur that has the black spots. Uh-huh. It's called ermine. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a type of delightfully soft, fluffy rodent. And it's associated in Europe and England with royalty. It's what's and on so like she has one of rim of exactly okay. And one of her formal portraits, she's wearing um, an ermine cloak. Interesting. And so it literal symbols of royalty, which Jefferson had said, "Oh, we're 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 a republican nation. We must do away with this." Mm-hmm. And she's like, mm, "But I learned this in France, and I'm really good at it. And <laughs> this is who I am." Um. So I think that was part of it. I also think um, she had more formal sit down dinners Mm -hmm. and less of the kind of open house, come in, eat from the buffet, you know, have a drink and leave. Mm -hmm. Um, And she also was, she limited the guest list. She would have much smaller events rather than some of these events. And it's so funny. Okay. I'm a dork. I was going through looking for notes for today and found one of my old papers about Dolly Madison's hosting. I love it. (laughs) Uh, but Dolly Madison would have these parties that had 200 people on a Wednesday night to come eat at the buffet and drink a glass of punch. But and this is something that I find like Elizabeth endlessly Elizabeth. interesting as it relates to today. So we, even in our discussion today and the way that people viewed her having boundaries or being too put together, too quiet um, or having a certain affect She's labeled as, you know, cold or, I mean, I'm summarizing cold, bitchy, snobby, whatever. Yep. Um, When perhaps she was just more quiet um, or didn't have the energy or was just a more reserved person in general. Um, I I still to this day, and and even in the way that we're addressed now, you know, Mm -hmm. I can't stand if somebody tells me to smile. Like that makes my... Uh, skin crawl but I think that in uh, other side of the same coin is she was labeled a lot of these things even if she was an incredibly kind person right just because of the nature of her being she's got a lot of these labels and now we don't know because she had everything burned right well and this is actually where I did my review for today um, along with my archival research review my notes review and this is like a little pamphlet and it was published by um james monroe's highland by the folks at william and mary and it's maybe 30 or 40 pages and it's really an overview and most of the primary sources are other people's words Mm -hmm. but there's an entire page that talks about just quotes from james monroe about his wife Mm -hmm. right she was the companion of his youth the solace of his declining years this world of care and we know, right? We know that she was those things. She was um, an amazing partner and political spouse. And that's not the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, some of it perhaps to her own fault. But we're uh, Mad- not Madison Monroe, right? The husband and the president mm-hmm. should maybe be a better, like, why aren't we listening to him? Why aren't we looking at him? Why aren't yeah. we listening to what he says? With her reputation, the number of times I've read, because there'll be a book, it'll be like the first ladies, and it'll start with Martha Washington and then Abigail Adams and then Dolly Madison. And then it'll be like 
Elizabeth Courtright Monroe was enigmatic. Elizabeth Courtright Monroe uh, was was reserved. And like, mm -hmm. it's the same paragraph just reformatted in every single one of these biographies. And it's like, you could have gone to James Monroe's papers and said, mm -hmm. we know this woman to be caring. Her husband, who we all say is important because he was a white president, says she was caring. But no, we're going to call him mysterious and enigmatic. Interesting. I think that's- Because that's her reputation. Well, and that's, you know, that's how we've memorialized it or sensationalized it when it seems yeah. like truly she was, you know, a, a... in the time your role as a wife was a lot of the definition of your, you know, your being, if you will. Um, maybe yeah. we don't view it the same way today, but she was doing all the right things and still she has this kind of this reputation just because she has a little resting bitch face. I mean, that bothers me. Yeah. It does. And like, again, this is, this was sort of, and there will be other pictures throughout, but this is one of the, like, this is what beauty looked like. Um, and to me, it, it, it isn't what we call beauty. Right. Everyone said she was beautiful. That's all we talk about with her. Um, and it just, it cracks me up. Like she was pretty and quiet and we don't know anything about her. And thus she is a bitch. Yes. I mean, that's very much summarizing. Um, it I, is, I don't think that. I'm just saying that seems to be the way that she has been documented. Yes. And the other thing is, again, we get to the, this question of like, does reality, how, how much does reality matter if reputation or if, if the public facing is all that we know, right? Mm -hmm. Does it really matter if I cheated on a test, if everyone thinks I cheated on a test? It's still going to ruin my reputation in academia. Mm -hmm. Um and the reality of it, it isn't important. So I think that has kind of happened to her too. The reality of of her true nature was overshadowed by the women who spoke about her and the reputation that was repeated from Washington society. Interesting. So the way she was sensationalized was just mm -hmm. negative. Yeah. Um, and there's there's just a lot more to her. And I'm hoping that this is one of the projects that I can dig more into in my own mm -hmm. research because... I think there's an argument to be made to be just slightly technical for 30 seconds. Part of this idea of public history that we've talked about in previous podcasts is more digital work. Uh -huh. And there's a thing in digital humanities called network mapping. And it's like, if you and I send texts to each other, who do you send texts to? So if you're sending right. texts to Barack Obama and I'm sending texts to you, right? I'm only one degree of separation. Yes. And we can do that with letters and try mm -hmm. to figure out almost, again, fill in the negative space that we don't know about her by looking at all these letters and connecting them. Mm -hmm. And then you um, can see and, like who was really influential in society. And not only who was influential, but kind of whose words wound up being um, the most effective in this case, right? Like what, who was saying what about her specifically? Because there were lots of women there's one woman named Margaret Baird Smith who was incredibly influential. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote some of the biographies on Jefferson and in Jefferson's lifetime okay. as a woman um, and published them in the newspaper. Um, so we know she's incredibly influential, but how much influence did she have specifically on Elizabeth's reputation? Interesting. So I'm really, I'm intrigued with, with new ways for us as historians, for us as people to look at women and to look at their contributions even when there's nothing to see or we think there's nothing to see. Um, that is an exciting thing for us to revisit. It is. And I can't wait to talk to you about specifically it. Specifically in regards to Elizabeth Courtright Monroe. Or any of the other women, Bertha Benz, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Pocahontas, which we will likely never find anything because the written, record, written record doesn't exist. But any of the other women we ever talk about would be amazing to do this, this kind of work with. Well, I'm excited to see where we go next with it. Um, thank you for your time. And I, I, a lot of this stuff I don't, didn't know at all. So it's really interesting to hear about the way that, you know, perception plays a role and the way that it's, it plays a role in recorded history. So thank you so much for all of your research. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Awesome. You too. Can't wait till the next installment. Thank you. 
A huge thank you to our incredible guests for sharing their stories, wisdom, and breaking down barriers with us. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Your support means the world to me and helps spread the word about the amazing women paving the road less traveled in male-dominated industries. If you have suggestions for a future guest or topic you'd like me to explore, please reach out on social media. I'd love to hear from you. Follow me on your favorite social platform for updates and behind the scenes. Keep pushing boundaries, challenging norms, and lifting each other up.